Good evening, everybody. Welcome to today's Taylor Tuesday. I'm Dr. Andrew Schneider. I'm a Taylor member and investor. With me is my co-moderator, Dr. Andy Baccia, who's also a uh, original Taylor user and um, investor. And our guest speaker, who we'll talk more about, but familiar to everybody, is Dr. Ira Kraus, who is the uh, the granddaddy of Taylor Medical. So um, just a word about Taylor Medical. If you haven't been to one of our Taylor Tuesdays before, we do these webinars the first and third, third Tuesday of every month. And the webinars are all archived on our website. So just go to taylormedical.com. Look at the top and you'll see, uh, you'll see webinars. And there you'll see all the webinars that have been done since its inception. Um, really some really great information, great products. And I guarantee you'll find some things in, in those webinars that you just didn't know um, Taylor was involved with and that you didn't know existed that could better your practice. And finally, if you have um, not done it yet, I highly recommend that you join Taylor Medical. First of all, it's free um, and it can only save you money. Um, so what Taylor Medical is, is a GPO, a group, pur group purchasing organization, and they we um, negotiate rates for from gauze through um, Medline to um, treatment chairs to, to really everything in between. And if you're going to make a capital investment in your practice, you really owe it to yourself to check with Taylor first to see if you can get a better um, a better deal on it. And in most cases, you can't. So what I would recommend you do is um, fill out a fill out a spreadsheet or just print out your um, your your last couple of orders for whatever um, distributor you're ordering through, and send it over to admin at taylormedical.com. And what they'll do is a cost analysis and be able to tell you what the same um, order would have cost if you ordered it through Taylor. I can tell you that since I've been a Taylor member, I've saved. Um, from top line about about um, 25% on my on my supplies. And, you know, where everyone else is um, getting nervous about their lidocaine supply, I'm happy to say that I'm not nervous about my lidocaine supply because, you know, Taylor has found ways to keep us all um, well supplied. So um, do that. Like I said, it's no obligation. It's no cost. And it can only really save you money. All right, I'm going to jump in here with a with a introduction to our guest speaker, Dr. Cross, who really does not need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. And he's a colleague and a dear friend over many years, a former APMA president and current president of uh, Taylor Medical, uh, and a uh, great speaker on a wide wide range of topics. And uh, today we will uh, hear from him about. Uh, Total Ancillary, uh, which is, uh, and, and the, the title is Advanced Wound Care Deserves Advanced Diagnostics. So what's Total Ancillary? Um, total Ancillary uh, leads in providing cutting edge chronic wound care solutions. And now it adds PCR lab services for wound and nail panels from Total Molecular. Skin substitutes uh, cannot always be used in situations where infection is present. And additionally, uh, foot infections are associated with increased frequency and length of hospitalizations. So as uh, many of us and uh, many of us in the, in the podiatry world, in the wound care world know, 50% uh, of diabetic foot ulcers become infected and patients experience a 70% mortality rate after diabetes related amputations at five years. So a powerful combination of uh, advanced wound care solutions for clinicians is Total Molecular's PCR Diagnostic Plus and Total Ancillary's Advanced Biologics, which are both designed to help difficult wounds heal. So we look forward to uh, this presentation. Dr. Krauss, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, um, uh, Andrew. Andy and Andrew, I, I got to make sure I say that right. Um, anyway, I appreciate um, uh, the introduction and, and, and both of you have been uh, longstanding friends of mine. Uh, for quite some time and have been big supporters of, of, of Taylor Medical. And I think that, um, you know, part of what we've tried to do here and the, the mission um, with, with Taylor Medical has been 
not just to have great products and not just to save you money, but we wanted to bring new technologies, uh, information that's going to help make your practices better, um, getting better patient outcomes and, 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 and trying to find good partners to work with. Um, I think that uh, this topic is, 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 is quite interesting. And I'm, I'm, before I even get into the slides, I'll, I'll just tell you that I, um, I am the chief medical officer for Total Ancillary. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with the company since its inception. And um, they have been a stalwart in the podiatric community, in my opinion. Uh, for those of you who know me, I try to support companies that support the profession uh, and support our colleagues. And I think Total Ancillary has done that. Um, I think that uh, the whole wound care space is changing. Um, for those of you who are involved in wound care, you know that there have been um, changes that have been occurring um, with the um, LCD policies. Um, you've heard um, rumors that there are going to be bundled payments in 2024. Uh, and I think what um, Total Ancillary as a company has been doing is putting together the full package and full compendium uh, for what we're going to be able to need and use um, in our practices moving forward. If you think about it, um, not every patient needs to get a skin substitute. I think that, um, that the fact that um, with total ancillary, you can do testing, you can do DME conservative care and go on to advanced biologics is a great opportunity and a great service. And not only that, the platform that total ancillary has is phenomenal for helping with the management of practices. Um, we are currently managing practices all over the United States in helping them with an area that has been very, very difficult um, to manage. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to just uh, continue and go into the presentation. For those of you who, who definitely know me, um, I will repeat things on a regular basis. It's just how I was educated and trained in my life, and that's how I educate and train people moving forward. Um, so we have an agenda today that we're going to talk about. We are going to Kind of review about diabetes and costs. We know that that's not going away. Um, and I know that uh, CMS is going to try and make some changes with bundled payments. And as we talked about earlier, some changes with the allowables for skin subs. General wound care information, uh, PCR for wound and nails, Custo Micro, uh, which is a, a pharmacy we'll talk about, skin subs and how we're combining everything together to give you the overall package uh, for, for providing care to your patients. So we all know that, you know, diabetes is an epidemic. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. For those of you that are practicing uh, and living um, in the wound care space and, and limb salvage space, uh, you know that that's happening. Every 20 seconds, a lower limb is amputated. Uh, the lifetime risk of people with diabetes to develop a foot ulcer is 34% and more than 50% of diabetic foot ulcers become infected. We all know from back in the day um, when uh, APMA uh, did, their, did, did, did some of their studies, we, we show the cost savings of the, in, on the healthcare system with just one visit to a podiatric physician. So um, when we think about the diabetes economics epidemic and the cost, um, podiatrists play a large role in that process. Diabetes continues to approximate, um, contributes to approximately 80% of the 120,000 non-traumatic amputations performed yearly. Diabetic foot also double mortality and heart attack risk while increasing stroke by 40%. Relative five-layer mortality rate uh, after amputation is 68% and is second only to lung cancer. So obviously this is a, a pretty tough condition. Um, the quicker we get these wounds healed, uh, the quicker it's gonna be for the patient you know, I also, when I talk about this, it's not just um, the impact on the cost of treating that wound, but it's the impact of what happens if, 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 if things don't go right. You think about a patient who ends up possibly with a BK amputation. How does it affect them emotionally? Is there, are, are there dollars spent on the emotional well-being of that patient? Um, the patient may not be able to go back to the job that they were performing. So now there's maybe workers' comp or disability insurance involved. Um, there's 
uh, the, the, the personal relationships and how they feel at going out in public. Some, some people become very withdrawn because they're embarrassed to go out. So it's not just the immediately cost of the system that's associated with uh, the admission of the patient or the actual care, but everything that's involved with the care of that patient. So diabetic foot ulcers are twice as costly uh, to U.S. Medicare as those with diabetes alone. The cost of diabetic foot ulcers is greater than the five most costly forms of cancer. In the U.S., a total of $176 billion is spent annually on direct costs for diabetes. As much as one-third of that will be spent on lower extremity complications. A million dollars is spent every 30 seconds on diabetic foot complications in the U.S. alone. Among patients with commercial insurance, each dollar invested in the care of podiatrists results in $27 to $51 in savings. And among Medicare patients, between 9 to 13 that came out of the Thomson Reuters study that I mentioned earlier from APMA. So we, as podiatric physicians and surgeons, we play a large role in this, and we have to let the community know what we do. We have to let the community know that our work is critical to fighting this condition. Wound care cost, the average cost of wound care is ten dollars to $20,000 um, on conservative care and an episode of care. Average cost of limb amputation, hospital costs, Thirty to forty thousand follow care costs forty three to sixty and total costs seventy three to one twenty. I don't talk politics for those of you who know me, but uh, you might all remember when uh, Barack Obama was running for his first term as president. Um, he talked about the cost of an amputation that physicians were getting paid seventy thousand dollars. Now I can make a joke and say if there was a code uh, that paid me seventy thousand dollars, I would really know that code for sure. Um, I think it was a little mix up on the communication, but the message was, the intent of the message was the cost of a baloney amputation with the hospitalization and, 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 and everything that's associated with it, as you can see here, is between, between seventy and $120,000. Um, and that doesn't include the things that I discussed earlier um, that affect the patient uh, with everything that's going on. So I think that um, it, it behooves us to try and get these wounds healed. You know, and when you talk about... Um, you know, the, the essential elements of good wound care management. You know, we want to assess the patient and treat the underlying disease. I think, again, for those of us that, that, that do this, when I think about wounds that are not healing, I think about um, is there um, uh, an adequate vascular supply? Um, assessing the wound and determine etiology, we're going to talk about that more in this lecture, uh, and address patient-centered concerns and optimize local wound care. Infection, removal of necrotic tissue, moisture balancing, offloading, uh, is it biofilm management, is it sharp debridement with topical antimicrobial? I, I think that when you work up these patients, I think that for those, in my opinion, who are doing wound care, have a clinical protocol that they follow. Um, and we're all going to look to see what's going on with these patients. Obviously, nutritionally, we need to make sure that the patients are okay. I think um, you know, if you have a patient who has an albumin of 2.0 and an A1C of 18, I don't care what you do, that patient probably isn't going to respond to the, to the level of care that you're willing to provide. You know, ensuring adequate blood supply um, is definitely uh, an issue. You know, I think that, um, you know, on that initial visit, you're evaluating your patient's circulation. You might possibly need to do a non-invasive diagnostic tests and or even send the patient off for vascular intervention. But if those things aren't taken care of, um, then, then we have problems with the ability to get the wound to heal. And when we talk about assessing wound and, 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 and determine etiology, I want to talk about that a little bit. I think, you know, back in the day, um, we all used to do cultures. Um, maybe some people took biopsies. I did. Um, you know, but technology has changed. And, and if you look at the majority of the LCD policies that we, that we read, and look at the majority of these policies talk about the utilization of conservative care normally for a period of four to six weeks. Um, and then if those patients don't respond with a greater than 40 or 50 percent um, healing, then you can go on to use advanced cellular tissue products. Um, for me personally, what I would tell you is if that wound wasn't responding to conservative care in that four to six weeks, something is not right. If you've checked the blood supply and it's adequate, that's great. If you've checked the nutritional status of the patient and everything is good, that's great. Uh, you've checked their smoking status and they've reduced or quit smoking, that's great. 
Uh, the only thing that's really hard to determine is, 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 the, is the wound and, and the etiology. And we all know that if we do a culture insensitivity, um, it's only going to reveal um, the, the live active organisms that could possibly be um, you know, affecting the wound. But it doesn't address the, the non-active uh, senescent organisms that may be there. And uh, it was interesting. I was away this past weekend um, at the uh, CPT meeting representing uh, APMA. Uh, and while I was there, I had a chance to speak with a dermatopathologist who um, was the CPT representative for the um, uh, Pathology Association uh, and works in a, uh, in a clinical laboratory setting. And we were talking about how things are changing in healthcare and how um, there's so much scrutiny for PCR. But yet, in, in, in my opinion, and that's just my, my opinion, there's no, um, I, I don't know that I, I, can, I can show you the documentation. But in my mind, if we go by the benchmark of four to six weeks of conservative care uh, before we decide to institute biologics, but we haven't really determined why that patient is not responding in the four to six weeks, I would say that the PCR is the perfect tool um, because I think that if you're using the right laboratory and you get a PCR test done, um, obviously that is dependent on the uh, colonization of the organisms and the exponential factors which with, the, which, with which the organisms develop. Many of these organisms are gonna respond better to a topical as opposed to an oral medication. And I think that it would behoove us not to see if there's any type of biofilm or bio burden before we even implement putting on the first biologic. And I say that because if you think about what the LCDs talk about with biologics, the LCDs talk about that every week you have to have improvement to continue with sequential applications. My personal feeling is that if there was a reason that was preventing the wound from healing um, with conservative care, we need to make sure that we address to the best of our ability anything that might potentially affect the healing of that wound, even going on to the biologics. So I think that um, what Total Ancillary did with Total Molecular is spot on uh, in developing a company that's going to be able to do um, laboratory um, testing um, and really take you through the whole paradigm of wound care. Um, as I said, uh, with through Total Ancillary, you can do conservative DME. We can do now um, um, pathological testing through PCR. And then if need be, and we've resolved everything, we can go on to advanced biologics. So I think that um, the, the portfolio is here. You know, every patient and every wound is different. Having a broad range of treatment options is important. Um, one of the things I've noticed in working with um, PCR laboratories in the past uh, was the fact that although I got the results, I, I didn't necessarily have um, a recommended treatment plan. And, and understand recommended doesn't mean that I have to use it. Um, but recommended is gives you guidelines to make some decisions on what's going on. So uh, when you look at PCR testing, obviously it's, it's, it's good when you have, when there's clinical signs of wound infection, friable red granulation tissue, increased malodor, new or increased pain, epithelial bridging, po bridging and pocketing uh, in granulation tissue, delayed wound, he wound healing beyond expectations, wound breakdown, enlargement of new ulcerations, you know, the risk for wound infections is greater than 50% of all diabetic foot ulcers become infected. And in fact, if you look at some of the articles, um, it actually says anywhere between 65 and 95% of all wounds cultured are going to have organisms. And I think the difference with what happens with these wounds is, what is the colonization? Is it single colonies? Is it multiple colonies? Is it increased colonization or is it critical colonization? I think identifying all of that is gonna make a big difference. Obviously, we know that there's a 70% mortality rate after diabetes-related amputation in five years. So, um, you know, clinical microbiology performs a sm um, provides a small information about the percentage of total bacteria species present, uh, particularly in the chronic wounds. And that's why I said this is something that, um, for me personally, I may not do day one when I see a patient. But if I have a patient that's not responding with my wounds, um, I definitely think I want to get to the etiology and get to the source uh, so that I can make sure that this wound gets healed. PCR on toenails. And I think that, um, you know, there, there's been a lot of speculation um, on the utilization and the benefits. Um, I'll share with you my experience. So first of all, you have a diabetic patient not responding to treatment. You have immunocompromised patients. Um, PCR testing uh, to develop um, a, a clinically sound treatment plan. 50% um, of cases are misdiagnosed when relying on clinical appearance only. 
um, complete co coordinates with conventional culture, uh, threefold increase in specific uh, detection of dermatophytes compared to cultures alone. And what I will tell you with, with PCR with nails, um, I think that um, when you do, a, a, let's say you do a DTM, I would say that statistically 80% of the DTMs are going to come back positive. But when that DTM comes back positive, I, I know everybody says, well, there's not that many organisms to treat. Um, I would I would disagree from the standpoint that how do you know it's not a dermatophyte, a saprophyte, or a yeast? And I think that what the PCR does is it helps speciate um, when you know that you have something positive. Uh, again, I probably would not run a PCR on every single toenail, um, particularly on the 20% that do not come positive, come back positive with a DTM. I don't think that it's necessary to have to speciate the organisms that are there. Um, because obviously the DTM came back negative. So I think that I, I think that the biggest thing is people have to learn how to implement this into their practice and how does it fit into their practice <clears throat> um, and how are they going to use the results that they get to help get better patient outcomes. I think that's really kind of what all of this about this is about. Um, biofilms are identified in greater than 80% of biopsies of chronic wounds, but only 6% of acute wounds. Biofilms are highly tolerant to antibiotics. Antibiotics only kill the metabolically active bacteria. That's why when we are looking at um, the results on a, a PCR, we're probably going to in initiate some type of topical treatment plan as opposed to using any IV medications. So, you know, when, 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 when we look at everything, we, we, we look at um, um, what are some actionable results? What can we do? Um, we can use hand-on supplies to swab the wound. We can send the sample to total molecular for PCR testing. The results are going to be returned in 72 hours or less. At the same time, when you're filling out your forms to do your um, uh, PCR, you can also have a skin substitute benefit verification performed as well. So this way you're saving time in the process. Everything for me is all about streamlining processes and making sure that we're efficient um, in our clinics. And this way, by sending in the PCR, we may treat the patient with a topical medication and there may not be a need to go on to, to advance biologics or we may test the patient. Um, the patient is responding. We see that the wound is looking better and we might wanna implement the skin substitutes because we need to get this wound closed at a quicker rate. Um, Total Ancillary is partnered with a custom micro clinical services um, they, they offer programs focused on an antibiotic stewardship. 90.4% 90, 90 of wound patients treated with compounded topical antibiotics combined with molecular diagnostics were healed compared to 48.5% treated with traditional options. Again, what, what we're talking about here is many times when we're looking at these wounds and many times when we're seeing these wounds, um, you know, if there's overt signs of clinical infection, Yes, they're probably going to have some response to an IV or a PO medication. Um, but even once that um, active infection resolves, if there's still biofilm present or, um, you know, not, you know, senescent organisms, you're still probably going to need some type of topical treatment plan. Uh, and that's where us utilizing um, custom microclinical services would come into play. You know, we know bio burden is a significant barrier to healing of all chronic wounds. Um, and it's the only barrier that clinicians have to full for full control to manage. So with custom microclinical services, there's a pharmacist that re reviews the wound swab or nail sample specimens assessing for bio burden. The pharmacist is going to create and reviews with the provider a patient specific topical antimicrobiotic, antimi antibiotic combination treatment prescription that targets each of the patient's specific microbial wound or nail infection census. The recommendation is sent to the provider via HIPAA compliant platform. Custo Micro partners with Custo Micro Pharmacy and Wellness, an NAP via accredited compounding pharmacy, to provide a combination of anti infective targeted RX and anti biofilm base. So basically, what they're doing is they're taking the results and they're making a custom combination of topical medication to help treat these wounds to resolve the biofilm and bio burden that is present um, on the wound to make that wound um, in a better place to respond to whatever treatment pro protocol you decide to use, whether you go back to your conservative care or whether you go onto your advanced cellular tissue products. 
you know, and, and I think as we, when we, when we, you know, and, and in reality, I could have started with, with slides like this, because basically what we have is, um, you know, we have our hemostatic phase, inflammatory, proliferative and remodeling. Um, normally when we're, when we're treating these wounds with, with biofilm or bio burden, you know, we're in an inflammatory phase and the wound is just not responding and we, we need to get it out of that phase. And that's where I think the use of um, topical antimicrobials has been very beneficial uh, in helping to jumpstart a wound that is not responding to normal care. Obviously, for those of you who are using and have used amniotic membranes, they come in a multitude of different ways. Uh, there's the amnion, the chorion. Uh, some have both, some have one. Some are single layer, some are double layer, some are tri-layer, uh, where, they, where, they, where they call it the, you know, the, um, uh, the fatty phase, the fatty level. So there are a multitude of different products on the market. Um, I think it's very important that you become familiar and comfortable with a variety of different products. I do not think um, that one size product fits all. I think that you need to make sure that you have knowledge of multitude of different products in your tool bag. Um, you know, what happens is all of these products have growth factors and cytokines, um, um, uh, extracellular matrix, and different things that are going to help jumpstart the wound. Again, it's a matter of making sure that you, one, choose the right patient, two, that you've addressed all of the comorbidities that could affect um, utilizing these advanced products to make sure that we've put the patient in the best situation for their wound to heal. Um, amniotic membranes are processed differently and have different characteristics. Um, you know, there are the, 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 the things that we look at cell viability, the extracellular matrix integrity, um, growth factor and cytokine content. I mean, there's going to be a variety of different things that we're going to address when we're looking at, um, at looking at the wounds and choosing a product. Um, you know, as these layers are addressed can affect the final product's characteristics. As I said, you can have amnion only, chorion only, amnion and chorion. Um, as far as the different ways that you can um, process, you have dehydration, which preserves the growth factors and cytokines. It collapses the extracellular matrix, and we know that there are no live viable cells. Cryopreservation um, preserves uh, growth factor cytokine, limits damage to matrix structure. Cells may or may not be preserved with some loss of viability. And then, of course, you have your hypothermic storage, which is the products that are the closest to a native cellular tissue. So qualified patients. Obviously, for us as podiatric physicians and surgeons, they have a, uh, a wound on the lower limb. Uh, from the standpoint of cellular tissue products, it should be greater than one centimeter, but this does not mean that you don't have a wound that might need a PCR that's smaller. Uh, because it's not responding. Um, again, the patient hasn't improved after, after four weeks of documented conservative therapy. Not necessarily, it's not infected. Unfortunately, even though we know that utilizing cellular tissue products can work on infected wounds, the majority of the package labeling on many products, as well as the LCD policies, um, do not cover the treatment of an infected wound. So again, we want to make sure that we're doing the best that we can to put the patient in the best position for them to heal medically. So what Terry and Total Molecular have done is they've simplified the treatment. Uh, they've taken the form that would be used for um, PCR and combined it with the information that would be needed uh, for the benefit verification of advanced cellular tissue products. So you have all of the information is on one form. Um, all of the releases, the consents for treatment, everything is provided in one form, so it makes it easy. So in partnership with Total Ancillary, Total Molecular simplified the process of obtaining and graphs in one convenient form. Understand also that we are not routinely doing PCR exams on every patient without getting some type of um, verification because we don't want patients being stuck with large bills because um, there was no verification done that this was a covered service. So we're trying to make sure in the process that not only we provide a quality service for the patient and we provide them with the technology and the treatment and the skills and the tools to get better, but we're also making sure that they don't get stuck with huge outstanding bills.
Um, again, simplifying the treatment, um, you know, depending on, if, you know, if, if you work with Total Ancillary, they will put together a formulary of the products that you want to use. Your practice can determine the formulary. Um, we can help manage the process for you. You don't have to be using four or five different vendors. So it's definitely something that's convenient. Uh, the process is agnostic. Um, and again, uh, Total Molecular is a laboratory that has just recently started uh, through Total Ancillary. Uh, they're combining it with the utilization of a pharmacological program um, to help give you the best uh, treatment plan and treatment course. Um, we also have the ability to use the DME and the advanced cellular tissue products. So it's really a full paradigm of care. Uh, I am done quicker than I would have expected to be done. I've actually been trying to talk slowly and, and, and add pearls of wisdom as I've gone along. Um, but that's the beauty about Taylor Tuesday. We do the best we can to explain it. And if we get done quick, it means you get more time with your family. But I'm going to open it up to um, uh, Andrew and to Andy and see if we have any questions or any comments that they would like to ask me to, to answer. Um, yes, we did have uh, a few comments, so I'm just going to go ahead and read them out. Uh, let's start with the first one. Uh, so a PCR test may help me to heal that. So this is a question. So will a PCR test help me to heal that stubborn infection I can't seem to get rid of? Well, I think that's that's the whole point. What PCR is doing is it's 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 looking at the wound and it's getting you a list of organisms that are present. And again, I think that when you talk about biofilm and bio burden, um, you're looking at you know the colonization of the organisms. And what I what I like to relate this to, and I've, I've spoken about this quite often, um, I look at a, I look at biofilm or bio burden. Um, very typical. If we if we think about the patients that come in with dry, cracked skin, and they've been telling me that they're putting Vaseline or cocoa butter on their dry skin, and it's it feels good when they put it on, but it's not getting better. Well, we all know that it's not getting better because um, Vaseline and cocoa butter um, prevents the osmotic gradient from allowing the water to re-enter the skin and rehydrate the skin. That's very similar to what happens with biofilm and bio burden. The wound is encapsulated by this um, by this, by the by, the biofilm that that is this thick film that doesn't allow anything to enter or leave. That's why IV antibiotics or PO antibiotics are not really very practical here. So that's why we want to use topical medications. So the PCR will identify there may be multiple organisms here, but they're not all critically colonized. So we don't need to treat every organism that's present. You know, a lot of times we get back a culture. And it has four, five, six organisms. But, you know, again, when you look at any of whether you look at a standard culture and sensitivity or whether you go to a PCR, what you're looking for, the organisms that are um, in critical mass that are causing um, an impedance of the healing. So, yes, without a doubt, uh, Andy, doing PCR on a stubborn stalled wound um, will help identify organisms that have colonized and that are not setting the wound up for um, ideal healing conditions. So, yes. Sorry for the long roundabout answer, but I think a lot of people don't really understand what PCR is and why we're doing it and how it differs from the traditional culture and sensitivity. You're on mute, Andy. Okay, is that good? Can you hear me yes. now? Now I can hear you. Uh, yeah, thanks. And so here's a question from me. So uh, are, are we swabbing differently for a, a PCR test and like, is it, I would think it's before treatment, right? Yes, it's before treatment, and and you know there there are there are there there are you know uh, total molecular has swabs and, and and products out there. I think as you know, if you even remember from our Taylor Tuesday last week, two weeks ago, uh, there's a new product that's come on the market where you can actually use a finger cot to actually debreed the wound while you're debreeding the wound. The specimen is actually in the finger cot, and you can send that finger cot to a lab. For testing, Andy, I believe Andrew, I believe you're using yeah, that. That was Andy's actually going to be my questions. Histologics, yeah, is the company. Um, yeah. But 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 you you can you can take that histologics cap and send it right off to the lab for a PCR test. So it makes it simple in one 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 handle, Andy. From that standpoint, so there are a variety of tools out there. Yes, we can do it the old traditional way, or we can actually combine it with other tools and actually 
debride it and bill for a biopsy because of the type of device that we're using to debride and get the culture. Am I saying that correct, Andrew? Did I give, is that the right yeah. information? No, absolutely. So, 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 are you swabbing, so are you, you know, if you're swabbing before treatment, I, I guess would be ideal, but if not, then how do you, uh, how do you confirm an infection? So, you know, so, so again, with, 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 with a lot of these, um, for me, for me with, 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 um, with the, the wounds that I have, if I, um, let's say I've been doing conservative care, Andy, I've been using, I don't know, calcium alginate, um, collagen powder, and the patient wasn't responding, you know, I would probably debride the wound so that all the superficial organisms would, would come off. And then I would use, um, I would either take a swab or to be honest with you, I would use this new histologics device, or I might even take a punch biopsy of the tissue and send that t deeper tissue off so that we don't have the contaminated superficial layer, because that's really not what we're looking for to see how we're going to treat it. Right. And, uh, and so what happens if the moon stalls then? I mean, like, what do you do? Is that a good time to swab? Yeah. I mean, obviously, if, if, here's the thing. We all know that there's metrics to follow. If you have a wound patient, I, I can speak for myself. You know, when I was in clinical practice, I kind of used the first week as my diagnostic week. That first week, uh, either I did a vascular test in the office or I sent them to the vascular lab. Um, if the wound had been around for a long time, yeah, I might start it. I might have started off with a with a culture insensitivity, um, but I I didn't. I always did a biopsy of the wound anyway, um, and I would send off the, the, the part of the wound for histopathology and for you know culture insensitivity. Uh, obviously, we look at the biomechanics of the patient, um, and normally at the first visit with my patients, I, I dispensed something in the office. I was a big DME user in practice, um, and I and I wanted the patients. They needed to go home with something the first week. They needed a treatment plan. Um, that didn't mean that when the first week ended, after I got all the results back, I might have gotten requested their blood work. You know, I wanted to see what their albumin and A1C is. You know, I'm, I'm trying to treat the whole patient. And I think that for those of us that are in wound care, we have to look at all the components and make sure that we're setting this patient up for success. So yes, if the wound stalls, we need to figure out why it stalled, Andy. And I think at any point, um, if the wound stalls, that we obviously missed something in our initial evaluation when we started treating that patient. If that helps out. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so actually, uh, a very appropriate uh, final question, which ties in both total ancillary um, and total molecular. It says, uh, if, an, or if an infection is found, how long after therapy uh, like antibiotics, for example, how long after therapy is it okay to use skin substitutes? Well, so we all know that, you know, I'm going to define that in two different ways. And, um, you, you know, I am not, so I like to push things. I like to push the envelope, Andy. And when I say that I like to push the envelope, if I, if I look at the LCD policy, and I read the LCD policy, a lot of it talks about improvement of a wound and they define improvement by strict measurements. Well, we all know that you could have a wound that's a certain size and it's draining fibrotic tissue, no granular tissue, doesn't look really good. And then you start treating it. And two weeks later, the size hasn't changed, but maybe the depth is less. You have more granular tissue and viable tissue than you had non-viable and necrotic tissue. So I would, I would think that that wound is improving. And I think that when you look at the infection per se, um, you know, when they, when, when, when the LCD is defined, if they're looking at the clinical, what's the clinical signs of an infection, you know, erythema, drainage, increased temperature, pain, you know, so obviously when patients have clinical signs of infection, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not indicated to, to bite based on the LCD policies, to apply many of these um, cellular tissue products. Um, but I would go on to say even further, if again, for me, if the wound had stalled prior to doing biologics, um, I might wanna find out if there's some underlying, um, you know, biofilm or bio burden, because you might not see that. You might not see erythema, you might not see edema, you might not see increased temperature. So I think the traditional uh, time frame, at least for me, when I was using um, antibiotic therapy or whether it was topical medication, was two weeks of, of, of antibiotic therapy to see if I can get the wound, um, you know, to, to respond clinically. And at that point, initiate whatever care I was going to go on to next. 
I, I, I know, Andy, you've done a lot of wounds. I mean, are your, are your opinions similar to what I'm saying or do you, do you feel differently? You're muted. Sorry, I keep doing that. But uh, no, absolutely. I, I, I agree with you 100%. And uh, this has really been my approach to, to wounds as well. And uh, I'm, I'm, very, I'm not using total molecular currently. And uh, I'm very much uh, intrigued by your presentation. And uh, so with that, uh, maybe you could tell uh, me and the audience how to get started with them. Easy. Um, right below me is the, I guess, I guess if we move our pictures, guys, um, they might can see the address. Uh, let me see if I can go to set. Oh, you got it. Perfect. Thank yeah. you, guys. So we have a phone number and an email. Uh, there's an office, a fax, and a uh, info at Total Molecular. Uh, of course, um, anybody who wants to reach out to me personally, um, feel free to reach out to me at ikraus at taylor, T-A-L-A-R, medical.com. Um, and we'd be more than happy to provide, um, uh, you know, the, the information for you to do that. Uh, and then um, Total Molecular has a world-class um, uh, customer support team. I mean, that's one thing they pride themselves in is their customer support. So um, hopefully that answers that question, Andy. Yep, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, toss it over to Andrew, uh, Dr. Schneider, any, anything uh, else, any questions on your end? No other questions on my end, um, but thank you very much, Ira, for a great presentation. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining us on this Taylor Tuesday. Our next Taylor Tuesday is going to be on October 18th. Our next scheduled Taylor Tuesday falls on Yom Kippur. So we're going to give um, that week, that, that Taylor Tuesday off for those who celebrate. And um, we look forward, and, and that on the, October 18th, we have, will announce a topic prior to the um, the presentation. So thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Krause. Thanks so much for a wonderful presentation. Thanks, Dr. Krause. And thanks. It was, uh, my, it was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. And also thanks to uh, Total Ancillary and uh, Total Molecular. Absolutely. Yep. And well, next. everybody, en enjoy the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the month. And uh, uh, for those of you who are celebrating uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, good Yom Tiv, and in I hope it's a safe and happy and healthy new year for everybody. And, uh, and, and for me personally, I would like to thank uh, everybody out there for supporting uh, Taylor Medical. Uh, we wouldn't be here without you, our members. And most importantly, I want to thank our staff. Uh, we have a great staff at, at Taylor Medical. And um, uh, if it wasn't for, the, um, for uh, Carla, Ashley, and Siobhan, um, and the interaction that they have with all of you, we probably wouldn't be where we are today. So... Everybody, thank you very much and, and have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone. Good night.